Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Center for New Television. Mrs. Jackson, as you suspected, you are pregnant. I suspected it. It is a little upsetting. It's going to make some problems. I went to a doctor who just treated me like dirt. He said if you girls would keep your legs together, you wouldn't have to be coming in here until after you got married. Doctor, I need help. I remember saying to the doctor, after paying him all the money I had, what am I supposed to do? And his response was, well, you've got to go out there and find the father and, you know, he's going to have to marry you. It was really a time when if you needed an abortion for whatever reason, you took your life in your hands and you were terrified, absolutely terrified. All you knew was that you might die, that this person didn't know what he was doing and he was going to take hundreds of dollars and you were going to bleed to death in some motel room. I thought my life was going to be making souffles and setting exquisite tables and cooking wonderful gourmet food and just being the perfect hostess for whatever lifestyle we were going to have. If somebody had told me that I was going to get arrested for uh, abortion and conspiracy to commit abortion 10 years later, I'd have said they were out of their minds. This is Chicago, the city where the skyscraper was born. This giant of the Midwest contains the same concentration of problems and achievements as urban areas everywhere in the world. In many more ways, however, Chicago is typically American. I started college in 1963 at the University of Chicago. And from the minute I came to campus, it was like my world opened up. And I loved it. I loved uh, campus life in those years. In 64, there was a recruitment of people to go south to Mississippi. And I was one of a number of northern students that went down to do both voter registration and freedom school training. Good news, good news. Freedom's coming, good news. Freedom's coming, good news. Freedom's coming, and I don't want to be left behind. Mississippi summer had a profound effect on me and I think on everyone who was part of it. We saw the value of working for a goal that was much larger than ourselves. We saw how you really could create change, change people's lives, change the reality by taking action. We also were involved in nonviolent civil disobedience because we felt there were some laws that were unjust and needed to be confronted and resisted. In 1965, after I'd returned from Mississippi, a friend of mine said that his sister was pregnant and was very frightened and was looking for a doctor to perform an abortion. And while I had never really thought about the issue before and wasn't sure what to do either, I made some calls and contacts and located a physician who was willing to perform an abortion. Abortion was illegal. The hospital and doctors wanted no part of any abortion and were not willing to even see you if they're suspected an abortion. So a woman bleeding and possibly dying could be sent away from a hospital. Everybody I knew, everybody I talked to who had become pregnant and didn't want to have a baby and had tried to abort, had done something really painful or horrible, and they were all hysterical and desperate, just like I was, just hysterical, desperate, and scared, scared. Several months later, word of that had spread, and someone else contacted me. And then several months later, 
word had spread again and someone else contacted me. And I realized that there was a real need out there. And I decided to set up a system for talking with women who were trying to figure out what to do. And I set up what became known as the service or Jane. Mary is 13. She's growing up from a child into a woman. Various changes are taking place in her. To understand them, we must start at the beginning of the story. In the farmyard, you can see how baby chicks grow into pullets and cockerels, which before long become adult fowls. We didn't know anything about our bodies at that time. We didn't know things like this. I remember that one day, the boys went in one room and the girls went in the other room and they told us about sex. But I think that they told us in such a delicate way that I got no information whatever. The people who called in the early years, uh, it was mostly a student network. First at the University of Chicago, then from other Chicago-based schools, and then on through other campuses in the Midwest. And my recollection is that I was receiving some of these calls when I was living in a dormitory. And I told people who called to ask for Jane. So it was anonymous. She had been running a kind of one woman uh, referral service, so to speak. She would check up and say, how did things go? And, and if somebody asked for more money, or if somebody was rude, or if somebody was uh, physically uh, unpleasant in some way, that person got dropped from the list. In 1967, I was married. In 1968, we had our first child. And I could no longer handle the volume, which was increasing, of people coming through on the counseling service. And I also wanted to be involved in additional things. So I started to go around to meetings that I just went to normally. And at the end of the meeting would say, those people who would like to become involved in a uh, counseling service, an abortion counseling service, they should see me after the meeting. It, it was a time when living consisted of being politically educated. Brothers and sisters, the time has come for each and every one of you to decide whether you are going to be the problem or whether you are going to be the solution. That's right. This was Vietnam, 1968 and 69 Vietnam assassinations and political disenfranchisement. It was after the disastrous 68 convention in Chicago with the police riots and everything. Police have gone berserk. Wanton brutality replaces rule of law. And a lot of people were disillusioned. It was a time where not to decide was to decide. The radical movement at the time was a male movement. And therefore, abortion as an issue couldn't be very important because it was so female. The whole world was supposed to change. We were going to have this big revolution. And everything was going to be different for everybody except women. So we had this, this one meeting. We decided to make it on women's liberation, and, which was in its early stages. And uh, Heather said at the meeting, she says, I know what something that we can do. We can do abortion counseling. I went through several of these formative meetings organizing the group, and I'd completely forgot that I myself had had an abortion. So that shows you what that kind of an experience can do to you. It just, you know, it was just a, a slice out of my life that I had cut out and put the two ends together, and that was gone. And one of the reasons we set up a consulting service, in addition to finding a physician, was to let them know this is what they could expect medically, this is what they could expect emotionally, and then to provide some emotional and human support for them. And since I was a social worker and I knew about emergency intervention, I thought, oh, I'll do that. So that's what I did. Changed my life. I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago in sociology and worked through the summer 
of 68 as a liaison between the mobilization to end the war in Vietnam and the McCarthy campaign. And after the convention went to work for the ACLU, gathering evidence to prosecute policemen for pl uh, police brutality. And one day, Jody came breezing in. She said she was working on a project that, def that desperately needed some help and asked if I would help. <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> and Jane turned out to be the project. In the early summer of 1970, I uh, thought I was pregnant. I um, called a friend of mine who was a medical student because I assumed, well, you know, they know all these docs, they probably know how to do it themselves, you know. And he said, uh, everybody here says, call this number and ask for Jane. Now, of course, at the time, I didn't know just how hilarious that was. Here's all these docs and medical students. They won't touch it, of course. They send people to Jane. Health was of interest to me, and medical stuff was of interest to me. And legal stuff was, was of interest to me. And this was a neat combination of medical stuff and feminism stuff and just hanging around and having a good time. Ultimately, I discovered after a very long time that I was not pregnant and called her back to tell her that. And I was extremely interested in what they were doing. And she said, well, we're taking in new counselors in the fall, and I'll call you. When I came to Chicago, I was 20 years old, or I was actually 19 years old. I turned 20 when my daughter was born, just two, about a week before. Um, we had had a big debate about whether or not we were going to keep her or not because abortion was out of the question. There was no place to get an abortion. First of all, I was embarrassed at having had sex. Who was I going to tell? My parents had no idea I was pregnant. I mean, I got married at a 24-inch waist. I mean, I was married in March. She was born in May. After I had my daughter, my mother's comment was, why didn't you tell me I would have gotten you an abortion? That was her comment. And my father's was, why didn't you tell us you could have gotten married right away? I mean, I think that, for me, was a very radicalizing thing, to be forced into motherhood, whether I, you know, ready or not, here she comes. So that's basically where we started out from. We started out from ground zero. And um, we had no idea it was going to develop into what it did. First, there was a physical level of involvement. We would drop them off, and then one of Mike's people would pick them up and blindfold them and take them to a building where the abortion would be done, and then they would be dropped back off. A lot of guys who do abortions come on to the women um, and are abusive, either on uh, moral and ethical grounds, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it, like, oh, you got yourself in trouble, or you're a bad girl, or, you know, that kind of thing, um, or the, the sexual approach. Um, our guy, none of that. He came from, I don't even think working class, I think even poorer than working class. And the kind of way you don't trust anybody and everybody's out for themselves. The first thing he said, I guess he said to Ruth and to me both, was we can't meet together, only two of us at a time, because if more than two meet, it's a conspiracy. So first he and Ruth go off and have their little chat. And then they say, OK, Ruth comes in and says, OK, you can go down now. And I go off alone with them. And we just talked money. I said, look, let's talk money. And he said, that's what I want to talk about. And uh, we struck a deal right away. I said, come down on your price. And he says, no, we're not coming down below 500. All of us women, I'm sure, felt that the fee of $500 or $1,000 was extraordinarily exploitative and made it impossible for a lot of people to get abortions who needed them. So when it 
became clear that this was not an especially difficult thing to do. Uh, pressure was put on him to teach us, say, hey, you know, look, this looks like something we could do. And amazingly, he thought it was too, and that that wasn't such a bad idea. The blindfolds came off, and the prices were coming down, and those of us who had known him the longest were also beginning to learn, and very quickly, very quickly, training others of us. So that I, who had come in in October of 70, by the beginning of 71, was one of the people who had already begun to do long-term abortions on an ad extra day that we added, where we were the only staff. We didn't have him, it was just us. What we did was we broke the bag of waters and pushed out the water, and then over a period of time, the fetus would die and the woman would miscarry. After I took the instrument in my hand, you know, he said, here, feel what it feels like. Here's the feeling you're looking for. And man, I could close my eyes and I could just, I could feel it exactly, exactly the feeling. And I thought, I can do this. And all of a sudden, this just vista opened up. Also, somewhere in that period, um, the group discovered, I don't know if discovered is the right word, I'm not quite sure what the right verb is here, it was known suddenly that he was not an MD. And then Mike was gone. Well, he'd already made enough money. The mafia had moved in on him. Also, he believed in what we were doing. And then after I left, it wasn't until I think several years after they started to do the procedures that I was even informed they were doing the procedures. And I was told almost as an afterthought because I think they thought I knew, but I didn't know. <laughs> and I was quite amazed. So this one time we were at an apartment and this last case of the day, the last woman of the day was supposed to be a long-term and instead of when I went in to, to break the water bag, instead of water, out came a body part. And uh-oh, now what? Better go ahead and finish this. You know, can't leave it that way. And we told the woman, we said, look, we're going to do a DNC on you. And she was, she's, really? You mean where it might be over today? And then we finished it, and it was like a party. The woman got up. She says, oh, I can't believe it's over. It's, it's over. You know, I can't believe it. She was so happy, and we were laughing and crying. And from then on, we said, hey, let's do this. Why not? Let's do it. When I went to college my first year, uh, there was this huge kamikaze sit-in in the administration building. And I joined it because it was the only social event that the University of Chicago had that year. And the people who were always leading the speeches always had incredibly complex, total explanations of everything in which everything fit into the common context of the Marxist whatever framework. And it always struck me as just nuts, just not real. And when I joined the service, it was just right for me and for the women in the service because it wasn't about talking or meaning or understanding. It was about doing. I wasn't feminist particularly. I wasn't not a feminist, but I think I was probably just too busy to think about it. I had two little kids and um, so I just helped out, and I thought it was a, a good thing to be doing. Some of us could hardly wait to get our hands all sticky and gooey. Some people were really turned off, really uncomfortable. People had to go through the training sessions before they could come to meetings and before they could find out about how we functioned. The way, the way that we tried to do it was the person who was actually going to perform the abortion did the hand-holding the first time around, 
and the assistant did the initial things, gave little shots and dilated the cervix and so forth. And then you switched places so that there was a real team kind of feel to it. I know the first time I was allowed to do anything and I gave a shot, what was amazing to me was that giving a shot was not, I mean, I didn't have anybody who went screaming into the woodwork. Actually, people would say to me, gee, that didn't hurt. I mean, how come it hurts so much when a doctor does it? Uh, and that really was, and maybe it's because when a doctor does it, he really isn't afraid of hurting you. He assumes that it doesn't matter whether he or she hurts you. Uh, whereas with us, we were very much concerned about whether we did it right or not. It was on the job training. <laughs> and it just lasted as long as you were there and had time for it. And um, when somebody thought you were ready to carry on by yourself, then you did. I remember the first time that uh, somebody put a curette in my hand and said, okay, you finish. And putting and going into the uterus and having an absolute three-dimensional feeling of what the inside of a uterus looked like. And it was just like the pictures. I think that for me was the most mind-boggling thing that happened because, I don't know, you know, you see diagrams, medical diagrams, and you say, oh, these are medical diagrams. But when you actually can feel that the medical diagram is correct, it was, I don't know, I mean, I, it was one of those, you know, gives you goosebumps kind of things. Uh, that was really pretty amazing. In terms of the population, there was a real shift when it became legal in New York. That was very dramatic. I think the price was about $100, $150 for an abortion in New York, plus airfare. And uh, then maybe you'd have to stay somewhere. So you were looking at... I don't know, $400, something like that, which for a middle-class person was not. I mean, you could do that. So our population changed. We then no longer had the population of people who could afford three or $400. We had the population of people who could not. There were married women, there were single women, there were Catholic women, there were Jewish women. Ask yourself how many different kinds of women there are, and that's how many different kinds of women came through the service. As soon as we printed our little leaflet and put that telephone number down, word got out. Pregnancy was such a terrifying thing then that when I did get pregnant, my mind went blank. I was just in a state of terror. I did not want to have a baby. I was 19 years old. I would rather die than have a baby, and I was so freaked out. I started doing all kinds of crazy stuff, like running up and down stairs, jumping off tables. I jumped off somebody's garage roof about 10 times and taking burning hot baths and everything everybody told me to try to abort myself. Um, I got a hold of some quinine and got myself really, really sick. And somebody gave me a number of this guy who was actually named Finney. And I called him up and he sounded just so ignorant on the phone that I. I couldn't do that. I would rather kill myself than let Vinny kill me. He wanted $600, and back then, my rent was about $80 a month, and $600 was a fortune you know, beyond belief. that I couldn't imagine getting that much money together. And then I was flipping through a newspaper one day, and I saw this ad. Pregnant? Need help? Call Jane. Click. You know, the woman would call Jane, there'd be this terrified message at one end of the tape, and then Jane would have to collect the messages and, and call and say, this is Jane from w Women's Liberation. You know, I'm calling to let you know that we're going to be able to help you. It was a, almost a personal relationship right there. It was a real, it's like I bonded with someone who, and I had to trust this person because she was going to be the person who ultimately would determine my life. I mean, I was putting my life into someone who was basically a stranger's hands. So little Jane, or callback Jane, would pick up the messages off the tape and talk to the woman, collect all the information, see what was needed, and then give her list of names to big Jane, who then assigned them to counselors. And then once the counselors gave the names back, Big Jane would set up the working day. We'd take the stack of cards to the meeting and pass them around, and people would take out cards and 
and pick people to counsel. And then you had the problem ones that were like somebody who lived in the far south suburbs and they were 16 years old and it was a secret and they were like 20 weeks pregnant or something. Nobody wanted that one. And then you'd have to pass that card around and around. Finally, somebody would say, all right, I'll take that one. They made an appointment for me to go to someone's house, to a counselor's house for a second screening. I, having an abortion was scaring me. Was it going to hurt? Was anything awful going to happen afterwards? Was I going to uh, bleed to death? Was I going to be was something going to happen so I'd never be able to have more children? At this point, you could have chopped me off and put me in, chopped me up and put me in a sewer because I felt that I had done something that was just totally wrong, that I would be morally judged, that I would have to live with my sins. So the first thing I had to do was get them to relax. My kids would be there. You know, if I were serving dinner, I'd say, you want something to eat? You know, I mean. There was never a sense of this is this horribly formal procedure. We told them right up front we weren't doctors. And some women that really bothered a lot. I never used any euphemisms. I did explain to them that the doctors call this a DNC, but that it was basically a Latin term that meant to open up and scrape out, and that's what's going to happen. And I would talk about how there would be cramping as the cervix was dilated. And that women ranged from little to a great deal of discomfort during that part. Um, and then I described the curette and what it looked like, uh, a long thin rod with a spoon with the middle missing, um, and an edge, a scraping edge like your fingernail. Um, and that's what's used to separate the pregnancy from the wall of the uterus. I was nervous because I was having an abortion, not because I was having a Jane abortion. I completely trusted them. It was such a relief to find them. Um, they had a good reputation. By the time I got to that point, I felt like I was just part of a team. We're going to go there. We're going to get this over with and go home and get on with our lives. Here's Sherry, 28 years old, 10 weeks, has one kid. Pregnant women would lie to us about how many weeks pregnant they were because they thought if they told us the truth, we wouldn't do them. But it wasn't like we would say, oh, your second trimester, go away. I mean, we would do it whether it was first or second, and we would be upfront about that, that you know, you need to tell us the truth so we know what, what it is we're going to be doing. Gayla. 13 weeks, 20 years old, D and C or nothing. That's a pretty tough order. Has $10 and right here, had VD. I don't know how many women I helped with miscarriages. I have no idea, didn't keep a count. I might guess 100, I don't know. The older women stick out in my mind the most because a lot of them couldn't tell their husbands that they just could not have another child and it was we saw some women who were really tired they stuck up out in my mind just because of the kind of sadness of their situation and then of course there were young girls whose boyfriends took no responsibility wanted no responsibility told them they had done it on purpose The youngest person I ever worked with was 11. She came with her mom. Her mother brought her, her mother was a nurse. And part of the politics was to have it be available to poor people. So that if we lowered the price, then poor people could come. And that was the idea of it. And then ultimately we had 75, I would say, 75% poor black women. Catherine coming in from Michigan 10 weeks, 16 years old, has not a penny. We were working three and sometimes even four days a week. And at first, 10 or 14 people in a day was a day. But I'm sure that by the end it was 20 people or 25 people in a day. 
And four days with 25 people in a day, that's 100 people a week. That got to be, that's a lot. The word was out on the street that there is this Jane, this abortion service that's very good, that's run by women, you can trust it, they won't mess you up, and that that was a place to go. On the day of the appointment, they told me that I should have something light or not anything for four hours. And to go to this house early in the morning, probably around 8 o'clock. We worked with two apartments. There was one place where the women came, that was the front, and um, then we had another place where the abortions took place. At the front there would be lots of people, people waiting for women to come back from their abortions and people and women waiting to go for their abortions and children, women, men, all different ages, all different sizes and kinds of people eating donuts, drinking coffee or tea or milk, watching TV, reading comic books and talking to the one or two women who were assigned to work the front who were doing, you know, sort of caretaking there. We did a lot of counseling at the front, a lot of additional counseling. We took everybody's temperature, make sure nobody had an infection or, um, because if they had an elevated temperature, that's something we'd have to know about. And the friends would stay, then someone would come and ferry the women who were waiting from the front to the apartment where the abortion would be done. The driver collected the money. What you'd do is you'd drive part way, you'd pull into a parking space on a side street, and you'd say, okay, <laughs> you know, and you'd just collect money. We would tell people, please pay what you can afford, assuming that there's somebody who has less money than you. And people did that, you know, so that I had my person paid. $36 and change, and, you know, we all had stories like that. Eventually, we rented an apartment that we could keep set up all the time, and that was lovely. It was really nice. We also tried to keep it very un-hospital-like. I mean, we had, we had crazy sheets, you know, stripes and flowers and pop artsy stuff. I don't know. That in some ways, it was like kids playing house. We had such a good time decorating it. We even donated our old makeup so that the bathroom looked like somebody lived in it. The atmosphere in the waiting room, it was kind of tense. Nobody was talking very much. Like, how can you make small talk at a time like this? And you're not going to be introducing yourself to the person sitting next to you because, who knows, you might be in, the pol in a police report the next day. When it was a woman's turn, they would come in and we would have already cleaned the room and put alcohol in the sheets and all this stuff, sterilized the instruments, and then she would be told to undress, so we would give her a shot of ergotrate, which would prevent hemorrhaging following the procedure. And then we would begin the abortion, and generally there would be someone to hold her hand. We would start with introducing the speculum and then giving four shots of xylocaine, a local anesthetic and then do the DNC. I think I almost broke the one counselor's fingers. I was squeezing her hand so hard because, God, it just hurts so much. Um, they did give us antibiotics, and they gave us ergo to shrink the uterus, and they gave us instructions for aftercare. And I, I didn't have any physical problems from the abortion at all, I mean, which was really amazing considering the circumstances under which it was performed and how far pregnant I was. I had a good recovery. I did not get infected. I didn't have any problems at all afterwards, and my next period was perfectly normal. And the kindness and the consideration, uh, particularly in light of subsequent abortions that I've had, it just made me realize how considerate the Jane abortions were. Now, what's interesting, too, in our case, now this is true of medical students, this is true of nursing students, but because they have the license, literally, and the license metaphorically within the society to do what they're doing, if they mess up, it's too bad, but of course everyone understands that some people make mistakes, and even if patients die, this is very unfortunate and it's a tragedy, but it happens, and you know, certainly the doctors and nurses feel terrible about it, but 
we accept this. But in our case, nobody would have accepted it. Our main problem was that we were illegal. And frankly, uh, you're under enough stress as it is having any medical procedure. Ask anyone going to the dentist. I mean, if you had to go to your dentist and you had to go out on a street corner and wear a carnation and somebody would pick you up and then they would take you blindfolded to this place where you open your mouth and the drill goes in your mouth, I mean, people have a hard enough time going and it's legal. Packing up instruments and dragging them up flights of stairs and going in cabs and being afraid you're going to be busted is not the ideal atmosphere for a woman's reproductive health care. Jane um, was very instrumental in, in making women aware of what their rights were and that they did have a right to, to demand the type of service and care that they got from Jane. There were people who knew I had had an abortion and whenever they heard about somebody who needed help, they would have them call me and I'd tell them all about it. You know, because, you know, they, they would call Jane, but they were hysterical and scared, and they wanted reassurance from somebody who'd been there, and they'd call me up, and I would tell them, you know, it was okay. We wanted to change the system. We wanted to create a reality in which women were in control, and we did. And I think that was helpful for the women who went through. I think we created a very loving experience for them, which was also very, very important, which you just don't get in a clinic where you're just another, you know, person coming through. We also had the idea that a woman could come, have an abortion, join the group, become a counselor, and learn to do abortions, so go through the whole cycle, that that was a very important thing, and that everybody had that possibility if they were interested and capable. The years just went by. I mean, it was sort of a blur. I was doing a lot of things, but the serves definitely took precedence. They called, I called her back, you know, and, and I said, this is Jane. Maybe that was the part that was so neat and gratifying, was saying, this is Jane. Well, the group was not a collective in the beginning. It never attempted to be a collective. It grew in that evolution toward collective work. And I believe by the end, when I was no longer in it, that it really had come much, much closer to the kind of political ideal that we seek in women's movement work. But when I was in, that was not the case. There were a couple women who had all the power. In the case of knowledge is power, they knew a lot that other people did not know, like they knew that he wasn't a doc before the other people. Um, they chose who they would tell and who they wouldn't, all kinds of stuff like that. Extremely manipulative, very um, covert. But the operation itself, the whole thing, the service, worked very well. They must have thought I was okay, because one thing I did know in Jane was if somebody wasn't regarded well. There was certainly a lot of trash talk about that person, and they were generally manipulated out of whatever the power core didn't want them to do. It just was the way things were, and while we might argue about it, we might dislike it intensely, uh, we had a job to do, and our job was to see to it that everybody who needed an abortion, who came to us, got an abortion at a price they could afford, not to have a lot of infighting among ourselves. I was just so amazed sometimes when I'd look at what was happening with among us, and friendships, and fighting, and all those kinds of things, and yet the service just kept right on working, and women got their abortions, and things kept going just the way it was supposed to go. I suppose that people who go to medical school or other kinds of health profession training learn about professional distancing when handling people's bodies. But I didn't have that, and I didn't really like it, and was increasingly uncomfortable with this unusual intimacy I had with these women who I didn't know. I think in the end, it was too much responsibility at too early an age for me. And I don't think we did this. I don't think we looked out for each other in Jane. It was all we could do, look out for ourselves. So I don't uh, criticize that that was the circumstance, but nobody was looking out for me. There were people who I would never in the world have been friends with. And 
I would do anything for them there, you know, and that doesn't go away. You know, there's a lot of feeling there. And we were doing something together that we really, really, really cared about. And the intensity of that is very hard to imagine. And you get, you know, whatever personal satisfaction you've gotten from that, you've done this together as a group. And that, it's, that feeling is, is spread then with the group. The illegal part was exciting and interesting to me. Um, I'm sure it wasn't like that for everybody, but for me, that sort of made it an even more valid activity. We knew that our phones were, were tapped at times because you could pick up your phone and not get a dial tone and hear people talking in the background. That's how unsophisticated the, the wiretaps were. And I remember once picking up the phone saying, damn it, hang up the phone so I can call my mother. You just get used to it. And it becomes a part of your daily life where you're just dealing with that. that well, it was not only your daily life, it becomes your life. So, miss, I've noticed for the last six months, you come in here and the only thing you buy are three pints of alcohol every week. That's very unusual. So I went to visit the pharmacist and he turned out to be a very delightful person to deal with. He knew what we were doing. He thought it was the right thing to do and for a nice healthy profit. He agreed to, you know, it was a, a sweetheart of a deal all the way around. I used to go there, he would order stuff. It would. You know, it would just be stacked in boxes in the back. I'd come in, back my car up to the back of his pharmacy, load up the trunk. And of course, what we were doing was so outrageous that I don't think that anybody, unless they knew one of us, would ever have dreamed what was happening, what all these women were doing. I mean, who, I mean, if you saw a bunch of women riding in a station wagon, would you assume they were going to have an abortion? I mean, come on, that's the most outrageous notion you can imagine. Cabbies, doctors, Everybody who referred anybody to us was in that network. The large non-conspiracy that was the service in Chicago. Some of us were active in other things, peace movement stuff, civil rights movement stuff, and um, women's movement stuff. And we would be on marches or demonstrations, and the same cops were always there, the Red Squad, you know, Chicago's Red Squad, et cetera. And they were always taking pictures, and they had files on everybody that they saw. And they once called this one woman, whose name was not Jane, Jane. Hi, Jane, how are you doing? And so, of course, then we knew that the political cops, or the anti-politico cops, also knew that we were abortion people. Until those men knocked on the door, and I opened that door, it had never entered my pretty little head. I'm ashamed to say it, but it's true. This was May 2nd, 1972. And we were expecting the guy, the maintenance guy, to come and do our screens that day. And the doorbell rang, and I said to Diane, I said, could you please answer the door? You know, I, we were in the middle of uh, breaking somebody's water bag. And the next thing I knew, there was this large gray man in the doorway. You know, it's like, I heard somebody say, don't let him in, don't let him in. And I thought, why would you not want to let the guys from the screens in? These guys who are so, you know, it's like, it's like a neon light, cop, 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 these are the police, it, practically like that. White guys, six feet tall, in trench coats, shiny black shoes. I opened the door and there were the tallest men I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what they said. I don't remember what they said. But I turned around, walked back into the living room and said, maybe they said they were the police. These are the police, you don't have to say anything. And I, I really think my situation was a little unique because when I came the second time, it's when um, they actually got busted. And um, then I really thought, oh, my life is over. The guys that arrested us were homicide cops. Abortion was homicide. And they hated it. And here they rounded up this bunch of middle class women. There wasn't this handful of cash that they usually found. 
there was this bright, clean apartment with all these medical instruments sitting in and antiseptics, and it just didn't feel good. Ultimately, what happened was that the police brought everyone who was at the place and everyone who was at the front down to the police station on Cottage Grove. So they had about, I think it was 40, 45 people, including little children running around screaming. Those police, I'm sure, were very, very sorry that they had done this. And they couldn't figure out, really, which one of us was, who were the victims and who were the, uh, the perps, really, because, I mean, everybody was so mixed up. So they had to sort through all their people, question all their people, et cetera. I remember the cop who interviewed me, he was wearing a short sleeve yellow sport shirt. And, uh, you know, like a dress shirt, but short sleeve. And he said to me, I see you, or, you know, you used to be a high school teacher. He said, I used to be a high school teacher. I was a biology teacher. He said, how did you go wrong? I said, how did I go wrong? Why did you stop being a teacher and become a cop? You know, it was very funny. Somebody must have called me and I immediately began trying to get money so that I could get a bond. And by the evening, I did. And there was some real fear. I'm, we were charged with like 110 years worth of felonies. It was really a lot. Uh, we talked about uh, starting a craft co-op at uh, Dwight because after all, you know, if we were going to be there for 10 years, we should do something, you know, that was worthwhile and we could be political and we could organize people. I mean, this was all, you know, our fantasy of what it, what it would be like to be in jail as opposed to being raped, which is probably just as likely as starting a craft co-op. The story that I got was that whoever picked up the call didn't know about the service and put it through the channels and the bust happened. Mm -hmm. That they got calls all the time about the service and they ignored them. And that must be true. It can't be the first person who told on us. One bad tattletale. I can't believe that. 10,000 women? Catholic City? Next week is the latest, I know, because I don't want your situation to change. And, uh, I know we had to keep things going. We had 250 women waiting to have abortions. We called all over the country to find, you know, and these place, this place. If you know, if the women could get there, they could get free abortions in New York and D.C. And they said not to worry. I went home. I got a telephone call, plane ticket to Washington, and I went to Washington to a facility and it took all of an hour. I know that we all stopped doing abortions for a while, and towards the end of the summer, I decided that I really had had it, that I was tired of having the Chicago police tell me what I was going to do with my life, that I was tired of people telling me what I was going to do, that I was going to make this decision. And for me, that was a very conscious choice, going back in and doing it again. I mean, at that point, we were getting tons of calls. I mean, you. Yeah, sure, the bust was uh, disruptive, but when we were back in business, we were back in business. I mean, it was amazing. So it probably gave us some interesting publicity. Also, there was an enormous amount of legislative stuff going on, and people knew that we were heading toward, both locally and nationally, a time when there might be an overturning of abortion laws. When push came to shove, nobody was willing to testify against us. One or two women came in with their own attorneys because they didn't want to testify. I mean, they were so angry at, at, at being asked to do this. Um, and the fact of the matter was that none of the women who came were pregnant anymore when they got, got to uh, court in June. I mean, how amazing that was. And these were all second tries. So they'd, either, they'd been taken care of someplace, either in Philadelphia or they had been taken care of by Jane. And then we just waited. And then the rest is literally history. The, the decision came down, and um, they dismissed the case. That was that. Uh, very quickly, as you know, it became evident uh, that really poor women were still going to have difficulty, that really young women were still going to have difficulty that most of the major serious problems around abortion had not been solved by Roe v. Wade. When we were illegal, uh, we had a reason for being. When it was legal, we really were illegal. 
I mean, there's a, there really is something called practicing medicine without a license when there are real doctors doing it, and real doctors will, will undoubtedly persecute you because you're taking into the, cutting into their business. I just felt like, you know, once it was legal, it was somebody else's problem. This was, I passed the torch, you know? It was over for me. I just said, that's it. I can't stand to see any more of this suffering. You know, I've had all I can take. You know, I would have dreams of, like, lines of people lined up, like, in concentration camps almost. This is how my dreams would be of these women standing there in line and, oh, just, I just couldn't stand to see the suffering anymore. I think that we just led a charmed life. I really do. I think that the gods were watching out for us. And I think part of it was that we did take care of people. We did give them antibiotics. But other clinics do that too. I just think that there was, that we were lucky and that also there was a lot of caring. Jane is a success story. And it's a great testament to the ability of a group of women who put aside personal differences and political differences. Uh, it's a testament to their ability to work together to accomplish something that if you looked at it on the face of it, you'd say, they could never do that. I felt really blessed that, you know, I was able to go on with my life, have this beautiful child, and, and I think I had the time to really properly prepare myself for it. I'm just really grateful that I, I was able to wait until I was ready to have a child. It would have been a disaster for me to have a child in 1969 when I was 19 years old. I was not at all ready, and I wasn't ready in 1973 or 1974, but in 1976 I was ready. And you have to realize that we're talking about close to 10,000 people who were so sure that an abortion is what was right for them, that they were willing to risk, for all they knew, their lives, uh, going to a, essentially a group of strangers in a non-medical setting doing something illegal. Part of what these movements are about is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they decide to take action. Look at the ordinary people that worked in the Underground Railroad. What it took was you to ha have the courage and the commitment and the determination and the belief that what you're doing is right. I, I always, I, I used to read about the Underground Railroad when I was a kid and it always made me cry. I worry about kids who don't care passionately about anything. Um, and I want my kids to know that if it really matters, they should decide which side they're on. We as women have rights, and I don't care if, if, if you're 12 years old, you have to ask questions. You ask questions because that's the only way you as a woman are going to get an answer. If you have to ask your mother, if you have to ask your grandmother, you have to ask questions. You want the answer, and the answer isn't someone telling you what to do. Assume that you must educate yourself and that you must find people who seek to be conscious and seek to do good and right in the world and be with those people. Seek women and girls who want to have integrity, who want to own their personal power and use it to make their way through life in this world and hang around with those girls and women. Don't stay where people tell you you're crazy, you're stupid, you're weak. Don't spend time with people who tell you oh, it's pointless, it's useless, or oh, they tried that, or it's passe, or this is post-feminism. Just say, okay, that's who they are. We're done with that. Now we'll move on to the next. It can be lonely, it can be scary. It will be lonely, it will be scary, but it will not be impossible. And when you go down to a, a woman's march a thousand miles away, and you're a long way from home, and you carry your little banner, and you have total strangers walking up to you after 25 years saying, oh, I remember you. It makes you feel good. I think it, it takes time to sort out what things mean. And the people in power often get to decide 
And for a while, the people in power really wanted it not to mean anything. I mean, what did the feminist revolution mean to Nancy Reagan? As she gazed adoringly at Ronnie, you know, I mean, so she had, those people had to believe that it didn't mean anything and everything was okay and it was the same and yeah, but they don't get, they don't get the last word, do they? And I don't think they will get the last word because things have changed a whole goddamn lot. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Center for New Television.